Hello and welcome to New Central TV. I'm Darshan Usman. The top stories at this hour. Kaduna Governor receives released Kuriga school children. Senegal's outgoing president, Macky Sall, congratulates opposition candidate on win. South Sudan opposition protests party registration fee high. Details shortly. We begin the news at this hour in Nigeria's northwest, where 137 school children abducted from Kuriga, Chikun local government area of Kaduna State, who were released on Sunday, have arrived at the government house in Kaduna. On Sunday, the Kaduna State government announced the release of the school children. Now, this was contained in a statement signed by the state governor, Obasani. However, the governor clarified that 137 school children were abducted on March 7, 2024, and not 287 school children, as was previously reported. Let's also tell you that parents of the abducted Kuri Ga school children say the last 17 days have been grueling. They are, however, hopeful that they will soon be reunited with their loved ones. Mabela Sobomano reports. It's been a mixed feeling for parents of the abducted Kuriga school children. Jabril Kuriga, one of the parents, said his life will not remain the same as he awaits the return of his daughter, Fatima. It was a regular school run every day, but the 7th of March was like every other school day. However, it became different as Fatima Jabril was one of those kidnapped by the bandits. Jabril says, Every night in the last 17 days has been grueling nights of lonely whispers as he wishes to behold his daughter again. Let me tell you, sometimes 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the night, I will wake up. Believe me, I will, I will just be crying because thinking, how is she? How is she? Why, what, has she eaten? You see, I think of that because I know if, 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 if say she's at home, normally before she goes to school in the morning, she eats, and then she comes back again for breakfast. And then, you know, when they close two o'clock, two, two o'clock, she she before she goes for Islamia, you know, she takes something. You know, I'm in always playing with her in the house, but with her absence now, in fact, I've been feeling very bad. Following the news of the release of the school children, for many it was tears of joy. However. Jubril soon realized that his daughter could not be identified in the pictures being circulated by the military. He is still hoping for a miracle as the children arrive Kaduna from Zamfara State. I've not, I've not seen anything about her. I'm just praying maybe by tomorrow I will see her. They said all the children are back. That's what they said. All of them are back. But seeing is believing. The State Commission of Police has called on community leaders to provide useful information that will help to tackle the issue of criminality in Kaduna State. I think uh, for the residents of Kaduna, uh, we need to just uh, reiterate that uh, they have to assist the security agencies. It is only by uh, cooperating with the security agencies that they will be able to uh, help them. While residents await the arrival of the rescued kidnapped school children from Zamfara State, another controversy brews over the number rescued and the actual number kidnapped by the bandits. Many parents are hoping that their children will be among the lucky ones rescued. In Kaduna for News Central, I am Marvelous Oboman. Thank you, Marvelous, for that report. Now, in the meantime, the Nigerian government has unveiled its strategy to respond to the alarming trend of school abductions. Amidst growing concerns over the safety of school children, commander of the National Safe School Response Coordination Center of the Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps, Hamid Abodouri, said plans are underway to train newly recruited personnel of the Corps across all 36 states of the Federal Capital Territory. Now, he noted that through rigorous training and strategic deployment, 
The school safety protection squad will serve as a formidable barrier against threats to the country's educational infrastructure. Now, according to the commander, the initiative highlights the growing insurgency to safeguard schools in the country and ensure the safety of students. Following the recent passing of the Student Loan Act into law by the Senate, Nigerian students and tertiary institution authorities have reacted to the passage. However, the new bill will enhance the implementation of the higher education student loan scheme by addressing challenges related to the management structure of the Nigerian Education Loan Fund, applic applicant eligibility, the requirements, loan purpose, funding sources and disbursements and repayment procedures. News Central's Omolola Ololade has more in this report. Report of the Committee on Tertiary Institutions and Tertiary Fund on the Student Loans, Access to Higher Education Act, Repeal and Reenactment Bill 2024, and approved as follows. Introduced as part of measures to address the education funding gap in the tertiary sector and provide access to higher education. The Student Loan Act, recently passed into law by the Senate, has been met with excitement on one hand and severe criticism on the other. For some Nigerian students, the act may not be for them, owing to several reasons. A loan is something you have to repay later. <laughs> so what's of people that don't have the money in, I don't know, the time span that I don't know, it's agreed upon? I don't know, so what would, what would be your fate? I wouldn't take the loan because of paying back, so I'd rather just find the money and pay my school fees by myself. I don't think I need it. Yes, and the requirements, I, I don't know about the requirement, but I don't think I, I fit into that criteria. Tertiary education in Nigeria is faced with several challenges, primarily funding with a significant impact on quality and access. Academics, however, believe that running tertiary institutions is expensive around the world, and Nigeria is no exception, especially if the country's education system must achieve quality education. I'm not sure that um, we can say education should be free at all levels, up to the tertiary level. Education in particular is extremely expensive. Tertiary education has major intrinsic costs. It's one of the most expensive ventures. Loan on its own is not a problem. If you, t I mean, for example, I mean, if you say interest-free loan, that's not a loan. That's giving you access, but you pay back when you have money. So I think it's not that we should have a knee-jerk reaction against loans, but we should look at the terms and conditions. More than access, there is a need to improve education quality rehabilitate infrastructure like lecture theatres, school hostels, and channel more funding to these schools. In Lagos, for News Central, Omolola Ololade. The Office of the National Security Advisor has confirmed the escape of Nadim Anjarwala, the Binance Regional Manager for Africa. A statement by Zakari Mijanyawa, head of strategic communication at ONSA, said preliminary investigation shows that Anjarwala fled Nigeria using a smuggled passport. On Monday, a news report stated that the Binance executive escaped from the Abuja guest house where he and his colleague were detained on March 22nd. Anjarwala was said to have escaped after guards on duty led him to a nearby mosque for prayers in the spirit of the ongoing Ramadan fast. He is believed to have flown out of Abuja using a Middle Eastern airliner, but how he got on the international flight without his British passport remains unknown. Nigeria's public debt has significantly risen to 97.34 trillion naira in the fourth quarter 2023, that's recording a 10.7% increase from the preceding quarter. Now, this jump is attributed to government borrowing and loans from international institutions to finance the deficits in the 2024 budget. Compared to 46.52 trillion naira in the fourth quarter of 2022, the Nigerian debt stock has increased by 118%. 
Now, with more Nigerians growing anxious about the rising national debt, New Central's Perpetua Fasami Peter speaks to a financial market analyst to ascertain the sustainability or otherwise of the nation's debt burden. In an unprecedented manner, Nigeria's public debt rose significantly by 118% year-on-year and 10.7% quarter-on-quarter in the fourth quarter of 2023. Before 2023, the average growth rate of our debt is around 16% per annum. Bear in mind that there was a significant level of devaluation uh, in 2023, and that is what, largely speaking, explains the 410% year-on-year increase. With Nigeria's population currently pegged at 218 million people, this translates to each Nigerian having a debt burden of 446,000 naira. Although the Debt Management Office expresses confidence in managing the debt, citing plans to boost government revenue, However, questions remain about how it plans to achieve this. Let's take a look at you know, the debt to GDP ratio, which is currently at around 42.3%. So the one thing that we bear in mind is that that ratio could have been a lot you know, lower at around 34%, if not for the impact of the devaluation of the currency. What is very important is to ensure that we, we borrow responsibly as a country, we borrow to implement projects that can you know, stimulate economic growth and activities. A further breakdown of the report shows that Lagos, Delta and Ogun states recorded the highest amount of public debt in Nigeria, while Eboi, Kebi and Jigawa recorded the lowest debt stock. The debt that you will need as a state will be dependent largely on, number one, the level of you know, projects or capital projects that you are embarking on in your state. It will also be reflective of the level of commercial activities or business activities that take place in such a state. As the government grapples with managing this growing burden, Nigerians will be keenly awaiting the effectiveness of planned revenue boosting measures in the hope that these efforts will be enough to ensure that debt remains sustainable in the long run. In Lagos, for New Central, Perpetua Fasome Peter. New Central now returns after the break. Do Welcome back and thank you for staying with us. Now, in a bid to reduce carbon emissions and combat climate change, the Borno State Government has launched an electric vehicle initiative aimed at promoting the adoption of clean energy in the transportation sector. News Central's Umaru Kirawa tells us more in this report. A walk of a thousand miles, they say, begins with a step. A soundless fleet of electric vehicles frontally challenging the use of fossil fuel and to ensure a friendly environment. The electric vehicles have been deployed since crisscrossing the capital city of Borno State, providing affordable transportation for citizens who are recovering from the shackles of insurgency. Before we are paying 150, 150 naira, now this, using this electric vehicle, we are paying 50 naira per drop. And this electric vehicle is comfortable. Amsada. <laughs> I met with Bukar Modu, one of the supervisors of the electric vehicles in Meduguri, who gave me more information about the initiative. It's such a beautiful um, car that uh, I intend to take a ride, but uh, unfortunately, I, I, don't, I don't know how to drive an um, electric vehicle yet. But then I will learn since it is here in Borno. And of course, the people are uh, massively happy with the deployment of this electric vehicle. 
inda a ce ba mu watan nan gaskiya kamun ka ga mai yawo a azumin nan zai wuya amma alhamdulillah yanzu kaman ba azumi kowa yana yawo kuma in ka bada naira 50 komin nisan drop za ji a sauke ka idan ba wuta za a tayar a yi charge so duk zaman da suke moto suke yana suna charge ne in suke charge za su je su aiki rand ba su aiki ba za ka gagarin ma akwai problem na passenger amma idan motocin suna aiki za ka gagarin is quite abun nan ko ina mobility na yawo a cikin gari ko ina da ko ina The vehicle is said to be part of commitment to transforming Borno State into a thriving urban hub. The governor has done everything possible. We have enough vehicles to cover the basic needs of our people. I want you to maintain this very important need and make sure that you bring down the cost of transportation. The cardinal objective of establishing the mass transit program is to reduce the hardship of the community. Now, when the use of electric vehicles becomes very popular and common, the big question is who will consume the petrol produced by Nigeria, which is the mainstay of the country's economy. This initiative has brought a remarkable transition in the transportation industry, creating new employment opportunities for mechanics, electricians, and charging station operators. While combating climate change remains a global challenge, no effort is said to be little in such quest for reduced carbon emissions and sustainable environment. In my degree for News Central, Omoru Kirawa. From writing a new constitution to tasking citizens and Nigeria's political class to imbibe the spirit of patriotism, these, among several others, were recommendations preferred at an annual lecture and book launch in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. The lecture, with the theme, Reclaiming Nigeria's Future, Strategic Frameworks for Advancing Transformative Change, reviewed the current economic and political situation in the country, preferring far-reaching recommendations to government to initiate widespread reforms and change. Amadin Ui has the report. With over 200 million in population, including vast deposits of petroleum and solid minerals, many agree that Nigeria is greatly blessed. We, Nigeria has so much talent, uh, so much resources, so much potential. There is no excuse for the challenges we are facing now. Despite this, Nigeria continues to suffer from economic challenges, unable to harness both human and material resources in abundance. With this in mind, citizens from all walks of life converged on Abuja for the annual Professor Benedicta Egbo Lecture Series and Book Launch, aiming to X-ray current situation in the country and prefer far-reaching recommendations needed to catalyze change. It's an opportunity to discuss, it's an opportunity to share strategic ideas of how to transform the country. Uh, in ways that will help us to achieve Niger the Nigeria of our dreams. After several key presentations aligning with the theme of the lecture, Reclaiming Nigeria's Future, Strategic Frameworks for Advancing Transformative Change, several in attendance preferred far-reaching recommendations for government to adopt. What we need the president to do is to come up with a presidential fiat by ensuring he writes the National Assembly on the need to reconstruct the constitution based on existing proposals in view of the confab report of the previous administration in view of the need policy and sdg goals and proper documents even 1963 constitution needs to be matched together we need more people we need nigerians to develop the habit of patriotism they don't know that nigeria is our country we have no other country than nigeria and no matter what happens, wherever we go in life, we must come back home. They say all citizens must participate in their efforts to bet a new Nigeria. In Abuja for New Central, I am Amadid Uyi. President of Nigeria's Upper Legislative Chamber, Godwin Lakpabio, has presented a compelling argument in favor of stepping up parliamentary diplomacy. 
Akwabia was speaking during the 148th Assembly of the Interparliamentary Union and related meetings in Geneva, Switzerland. He asserted that parliamentary diplomacy plays a crucial role in attaining global peace and resolving disputes. Now, the Senate president also called for more progress in parliamentary diplomacy, adding that though the Nigerian parli parliament has explored the concept and made some gains, more can still be done. Persons living with disabilities have called on Nigeria's President Bola Tinubu to appoint a Minister of Humanitarian Affairs from their community. They say this will ensure that humanitarian initiatives and interventions reach the desired recipients as the Minister will have a hands-on experience of working with the disability community. They made this call in Abuja as they converged on the Unity Fountain to pray for the nation calling on God's intervention to help Nigeria surmount its current challenges. Amadin Ui reports. They converged on the Unity Fountain in Abuja over the current economic situation in the country. The group, persons living with disabilities from both the Christian and Muslim faiths, said there is a need to intervene on behalf of the country. For our efforts to yield positive results, Prayer is one powerful weapon that brings answer quick to every endeavors of humanity. And that is why he deemed it fit in his wisdom that at this holy month of Ramadan, we, uh, that God hears and answers prayers of people, that we need to call upon the Almighty God uh, to intervene, intervene in the affairs of Nigeria, in the areas of security and economic uh, hardship that we are currently uh, facing. Sin is a factor that brings what uh, out of terrorism, out of uh, banditry, out of uh, kidnapping. All is as a result of something we have neglected, something we are not doing, something both the lead and the leaders are not doing, and have resulted to this, a neglect. So when we now return back to God Almighty in prayer, in seeking his face, uh, forgiveness is inevitable by God. He will definitely forgive us. No one is happy with the situation of things. And uh, as you know, the economic crisis or the hardship in this country is seriously biting on us, we persons with disability. It's seriously biting on us. And uh, we have gathered here, you can see both the Christians and the Muslims, we are all praying for God to intervene. They also called on President Bola Tinubu to appoint one of their own as the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Alleviation. They say this will help the minister connect and reach out to members of their community in need. The non-performance of uh, the Honorable Ministers in the Minister of Humanitarian and Poverty Alleviation, which is the uh, main ministry of persons with disabilities, where 95% of activities there is meant for persons with disabilities. So why shouldn't they listen to us in appointing persons, uh, persons that will, marry, will be the Minister for Humanitarian? That Mr. President will look at us as our boys to the voiceless of 35 million people in Nigeria to give Dr. Halima Adenike to Joshua that seat of the Minister of Humanitarian and Poverty Alleviation in this Nigeria. They are also calling for more inclusion in government, saying they want to be involved in the decision-making process of the country. In Abuja for News Central, I am Amadine Uyi. You're still watching News Central now. Coming up after the break, Senegal's outgoing president, Macky Sall, congratulates opposition candidate Basiru Diomaye Fai. Details after the break. Thank you for staying with us. Now, Senegal's opposition candidate, Basiru Diomaye Fai, was set to be declared the country's next president. Now, results trickling in since polls closed on Sunday evening in the first round of a delayed presidential election rapidly suggested Fai may have clinched an outright majority. Now, the trends announced on uh, local media sparked street celebrations by his supporters in the capital, Dakar. Ruling coalition candidate Amadou Ba initially called these celebrations premature and said a runoff vote would be needed to determine the winner. 
A peaceful transition of power in Senegal would mark a boost for democracy in West Africa, where there have been eight military coups since 2020. Still in Senegal, the outgoing president, Macky Sall, congratulated opposition candidate Basir Rudioma Fai as his successor on Monday, hailing a victory for Senegalese democracy after Fai's rival conceded the race. Saul offered his congratulations after governing coalition candidate Amadou Ba recognized Fay's first round win. Now the president salutes the smooth running of the election and congratulates the winner Basiru, who the poll trends shows as winning. Joining us on the news from Dakar, Senegal, to discuss this is Moriba Chisoko. He's an activist and a political leader. Hello, Moriba. Thank you so much for joining us at this time. Thank you for having me. All right. So President Macky Sall has congratulated Fai on, you know, winning the first round of election. What do you make of this? I think uh, thank you for having me again uh, this afternoon. It's uh, I think it's a good decision that he has that he had take, you know. We know he's, he was not running. We were expecting, you know, from Amadouba, you know, just to congratulate first. But the fact that Makisal did it, it showed that, you know, there is no way to have a second term. But it also showed to Senegalese and the world that, you know, our democracy is still, you know, a great democracy in this, in the, in this region. As you mentioned, you know, there is many coup d'etat that happened in the past, but Senegal is still, you know, struggling, you know, in the democracy, in the electoral process. But it's still being that democracy that we can be proud of, you know, I can say in West Africa, but also, you know, in Africa, and in, in, the, in the world. All right. Well, uh, Maribo, now, can you speak to us on the governing coalition stands on a potential runoff election? You know, considering that the country was launched into chaos after uh, Saul's postponement of the election earlier. Is there a likelihood of further tensions if a runoff is indeed announced? No, I think that this is the bottom line, you know, of tension that, you know, Senegalese people faced and my face, you know, for this for these coming coming days, you know, month and year. I think now it's clear that, you know, the transition, you know, should happen as soon as possible. I'm saying it because Makisal has to leave the power before April second. And I think that because if there is no second turn, second, second round, he will be doing it as soon as possible, which is meaning he will call, you know, his ally and all those people, those par political party and movement that was supporting him to accept that they failed and Basiru Joma is, 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 the, is the elected president. But also keep in mind that, you know, um, uh, the regional, you know, institution like ECOWAS, you know, um, like uh, the African Union, like the European Union, like the State Department, all those institutions that are trying to guarantee you know democracy in our country in our country in our continent are watching us and i think from that i can say you know we are in the right way you know of a very peaceful and democratic transition from the april 2nd to the becoming five five years all right now we're actually seeing so many people celebrating this win uh, but if we could actually hear from you how are the people in the country responding to the events unfolding, especially in the political scene? You know, uh, uh, Fai's win, uh, Maki Sall, you know, uh, you know uh, congratulating him, and Amadou Ba's call for a runoff. I think we are, since yesterday night, you know, everybody was happy, you know, uh, because we know that what we faced, you know, with, with, with the regime of Maki Sall, was one of the war, you know, that our generation, you know, will never forget. You know, even if the fasting month, which is a very, you know, um, highlighted in the religion way, you know, for Muslims, you know, people were dancing, people were singing. There was a crowd, you know, in, in all, 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 around, all around the country. And it showed that, you know, there is a need, you know, that people were looking for and we have it. But at the same time, before Maki Sal congratulated, you know, uh, Basiru Jomayafai, before Amoruba, all those nine, 18 candidates did it, and, and they, did, they did it yesterday night. You know, from, 12, from, from, from 8 p.m., you know, to midnight, all of them made a statement 
congratulating, you know, um, Bashiru Jamai, Bashiru Jamai for the win. But now only, you know, even like the young generation of political leader of civil mover, civil society, you know, all those 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 dynamic knew that the election will be won, will be won by uh, by by Jamai, and 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 all of all all them, you know, congratulate him. But you know, just to end, I want to say, you know. We as young Senegalese, you know, our country has 70% of, of, of young people. We are really proud of, you know, what's happening. And we hope, we hope, you know, uh, Bashiru Jomaifai will be uh, the president, you know, for our generation, knowing that he's celebrating his 44 years, you know, today, you know, and hope that day, that day will be a blessing day for, for, for our country and for everybody. I uh, will hope to see that day. Well, thank you so much, uh, Moriba Chisoka, for joining me and speaking on this. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, away from that, South Africa's Electricity Minister, Tosiento Ramokopa, says six power stations need immediate attention as the winter months approach. The minister also shed some light on the state of the power grid on Monday, announcing the utilities' efforts to ramp up planned maintenance at several plants. Ramogopa said the colder months, starting from around May, tend to see a significant increase in demand for energy, placing the grid at risk of higher levels of load shedding. Now, the minister also said ESCOM would present its winter load shedding plan closer to the start of the winter season. Consistent with that uh, application, as I've mentioned before, we have identified uh, six power stations that uh, requires uh, uh, urgent and immediate attention because they're likely going to give us uh, the best returns. And amongst them, Tutuka, uh, Kendall, Kusile, Majuba, those that uh, we think that uh, we will receive uh, the best returns. But I must emphasize that this arrangement is across the entire fleet of ESCOM and not, not just isolated to particular stations, but there are these stations that uh, um, essentially over a period of time um, they've, uh, they've uh, they come across as being uh, uh, pro problematic and therefore they require uh, added attention. And the second area of uh, intervention, outside uh, that relationship with the original equipment manufacturers, because that is uh, defined in the contract, is the need for us to ensure that uh, there's, uh, we introduce a degree of speed and agility uh, in the procurement or, and maintenance uh, of this uh, of this unit from the point of view of procuring the space especially those that are outside south sudanese opposition parties protested on monday at an exorbitant fifty thousand dollar fee to register ahead of the fragile country's first ever elections branding it as a slap in the face of democracy now, dozens of members of a coalition of 14 opposition parties joined a march to the council's headquarters in Juba to deliver a petition protesting at the cost. Previously, the fee was £20,000, but the council has not given a reason for the vast increase. Now, the world's youngest nation is due to go to the polls by the end of the year under a 2018 peace deal. Meanwhile, the United Nations and others say key obstacles still need to be overcome if they are to take place. You're watching News Central now. Still ahead. UN Security Council adopts resolution on immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Find out more after the break. In other news from around the world, the United Nations Security Council has demanded an immediate ceasefire between Israel and the Palestinian group Hamas in Gaza. The Security Council is also asking for the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages as the United States abstained from the vote. The remaining 14 council members voted for the resolution on Monday. Speaking after the vote, U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Linda Thomas-Greenfield, blamed Hamas for the delay in passing a ceasefire resolution. 
Thomas Greenfield stressed that the release of captives will lead to the increase in humanitarian aid in the besieged coastal enclave. United Nations Chief Antonio Guterres on Monday called for an end to the ongoing war in Gaza. Guterres made the call at a joint press conference with the Jordanian Foreign Minister Ayman Safadi as the UN Security Council is set to vote on a new draft resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and the release of hostages. The United Nations chief defended the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees as a lifeline of hope and dignity and called for a surge of aid into Gaza. His remarks come as the agency faces a financing crisis after some key donor countries cut off funding following Israeli accusations that several UNRWA staff in Gaza were involved in the October 7th Hamas attack. In relation to the northern part of Gaza, it is absolutely essential to have a massive supply of humanitarian aid now. And this means opening more entry points. It is so important that finally the Security Council became able to approve a resolution asking for a ceasefire in Gaza. But uh, at the same time, it is our duty to do everything to mobilize the whole of the international community. And I see a consensus emerging in the international community, even in the countries that are friends and allies of Israel, I see a consensus emerging that this war must stop. The Israeli government is not listening. Uh, they are still really affirming that they will go into Rafah. And uh, uh, I would just conclude by saying that we cannot allow uh, a group of radicals, uh, racist, extremist ministers uh, to doom the future. Now in business, the organized private sector of Nigeria, OPSN, is contemplating legal action against commercial banks in Africa's largest economy for failing to fulfill forex requests leading to prolonged delays. Additionally, OPSN demands a thorough audit of the Central Bank of Nigeria's forex backlog payments, disputing the Apex Bank's assertion of clearing all valid backlogs. OPSN members criticized the lack of transparency and disclosure in the CBN's backlog settlement process. Despite a recent stakeholder meeting convened by the Ministry or Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, including Nasima, MAN, affected banks and customers, where discussions were held on March 21, 2024, the threat of litigation persists. Now, this underscores the dissatisfaction among OPSN members regarding the handling of forex backlogs and their determination to seek legal recourse. Nigeria's Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment has mandated applicants of the Presidential Conditional Grant Scheme to submit their national identification numbers, that's NIN, to access grants aimed at mitigating the impact of recent economic reforms on businesses. The scheme, managed by the Bank of Industry, which plans to disburse 200 billion naira across three funding categories to support manufacturers and business nationwide. Now, this directive aligns with new regulations from the Central Bank of Nigeria, requiring citizens to link their NIN with their bank accounts. Trade Minister Doris Aniete announced the requirement via her official communication platform. This move underscores the government's efforts to enhance financial transparency and compliance with regulatory measures while providing critical support to businesses amidst economic challenges.
Now in the world of sports, vice captain of the Nigerian men's national football team, William Troost Ekong, has revealed he will be fit for the start of next season. Troost Ekong went under the knife last month following a thigh injury he sustained at the 2023 Africa Cup of Nations in Cote d'Ivoire, ruling him out for the rest of the season. The 30-year-old centre-back who plays for Greek Super League, uh, Pauk Thessaloniki, has disclosed he will be fit for action again by the end of May. Pauk are currently in second place on the table in the race for the league title. Now, his return will be a timely boost for the Super Eagles, who will face South Africa and Benin Republic in a 2026 World Cup qualifier in June. Still in sports, Asante Kotoko have described the behavior of its supporters as detestable during their 1-0 defeat at home to Nations FC in a Ghana Premier League match on Sunday. The irate fans vented their anger on the match officials by abusing them verbally and in some instances attempted physical assault. The Porcupine Warriors have been charged by the Ghana Football Association for misconduct and have up to Wednesday, March 27, 2024, to offer a response. A first-half goal by Asamoa Boateng Afriye saw newly promoted Nations FC beat Kotoko 1-0 at the Babayara Stadium in Kumasi. Asante Kotoko are currently winless in their last four matches in the Premiership and have dropped to ninth position in the league standings. And that's all at this hour. But before we go, let's take another look at some of our top stories. We told you that Kaduna Governor receives release Kuriga school children. We also told you that Senegal's outgoing president, Marquis Sall, congratulates opposition candidate on win. And finally, you heard that South Sudan opposition protests party registration fee hike. Send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen. Do follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. You can watch New Central live on DSTV channel 422, Star Times channel 274, Avo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I'm Darshan Usman.